I'm J.G. Michael, and this is Parallax Views. On this edition of Parallax Views, we are joined by a true artistic legend, the Academy Award and Golden Globe nominated screenwriter and director, John Sills, whose socially conscious cinematic credits include 1980's highly influential Return of the Secaucus 7, the critically acclaimed 1987 coal miner union drama Matt Wan, 1991's City of Hope, 1992's award-winning Passion Fish, the star-studded 1996 neo-western mystery Lone Star, 1997's Men with Guns, and 2010's Philippine-American War period drama Amigo. And I should probably also note, as a fan, that he has also dabbled in the world of B-movies, having written the screenplays for such genre pictures as Piranha, The Howling, and my favorite, Alligator. In addition to all of this, John is also an accomplished short story writer and novelist whose written ward works include Pride of the Bimbos, Union Dues, The Anarchists' Convention, Los Gusanos, and A Moment in the Sun. John joins us on this edition of the program to discuss his latest novel, Yellow Earth, available now from Haymarket Books which details the volatile social changes that occur in a small town in the aftermath of a shale oil boom. A timely novel that deals with the subject of fracking, John is going to tell us the basic plot of Yellow Earth as well as giving some details on the issues that arise from fracking and the economic impacts of boom and bust cycles that affect people not only in his story, but also in real life. We also talk a little bit about John's biography, his involvement in the B-movies of Roger Corman, the aforementioned coal miner union drama Matt Wan, how real-world experiences can be just as helpful to a filmmaker and storyteller as film school, and much, much more. So, with all of that being said, why don't we get right to the conversation with the legendary John Sills, author of the fantastic new novel available now from Haymarket Books, Yellow Earth. And now, a word from our sponsor. My name is Joseph L. Flatley, and I'm a journalist who specializes in conspiracy theories and French culture. Over the years, I've met cultists and occultists, flat earthers, and doomsday bunker salesmen, to name only a few. One thing I hear often is that the end of the world is near, and these days, you have to wonder if there might be some truth to that. My new podcast is called Failed State Update. Through interviews and original reporting, each episode asks the question, is the world ending or does it just seem like it is? Think of it as fresh air for the Orwellian dystopia we've suddenly found ourselves in. 
Available now on iTunes, Spotify, Anchor, and wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Parallax Views. John Sills, independent filmmaker, screenwriter, novelist, and author of the great new book, Yellow Earth. How are you doing today, John? These are pretty wild times we find ourselves in. Yeah, it's it's feeling kind of apocalyptic. I'm I'm way out in the boonies. I'm off on the uh, Long Island Sound here. And so I'm I'm reading about most of what's happening, but um, it doesn't seem very good. So I, I'm just curious before we dive into uh, the book and your work, what do you make of these uh, current protests? What do you think uh, has really come to a head when it comes to these protests? Why do you think now? Do you think what was the the sort of boiling point for it? Well, I, I think there's there's a couple different kinds of people on the street. Um, there are people, you know, the the black life Black Lives Matter thing that just adds up. It's just um, you know, it's like they killed somebody else that way, and seeing a video of it that plays over and over and over and over again, um, which is important, I think. Um, so these things don't happen in a vacuum. Um, you know, finally people have just had enough. And that's, that's one kind of person who's on the street is I've just had enough and I'm not sitting at home anymore. Um, and you know, there, there, there's a combination of things and some of it is frustration about general racism. And some of it is frustration about this, this very, simple thing, which is everybody, I, every African-American I know, um, no matter what their class, no matter what their education, no matter what their income, they have to have this talk with their children, especially the young men in their family, um, very early on about how you have to be on the street and that the policeman is not your friend and that you have to avoid policemen. And you have to be really, really careful if one stops you for any reason. Um, you have to be afraid and and act accordingly that this is somebody with a gun who is afraid of you in some way and isn't going to cut you the same break that uh, he's going to cut a white kid. You know, and that was true when I was a kid. It's <laughs> still true. And I was a kid a long time ago, and so how come it's still true? We should be moving forward on that, you know. So that that you know that that's the the basic bunch of people who who started coming out. I think then there's a bunch of people who are out um, protesting that Donald Trump, you know, somehow dodged his impeachment, um, and and you know, and there's two reasons he was able to dodge it. One is because he uh, was able to, you know, pull rank and say all these people who probably should be able to be pulled in front of Congress to um, testify under oath. Um, I'm ordering them not to go in front of the, you know, in front of the duly elected Congress and testify. Um, and then because, you know, the Republican Party has just decided well, he's our guy. We don't care if he's destroying the country. Our only chance of staying in power is if he wins again. And so the hell with the country, let's stay in. Um, so that that adds a bunch of people on the street who are also pissed off um, about black men being killed by cops overreacting. Um, and, you know, and then I think, you know, there's people on the street who say, OK, um, I haven't had a job in a while. Um, shit's happening on the street. I'm going to go out and, you know, help myself to something. Um, and that's always, you know, something that gets attached to these protests. Have you, I, I'm just you know. curious because I, I'm a bit on 
the younger side. I'm I'm only 28. I think you've seen mm-hmm. uh, a lot over the years. Has there ever been yeah. anything like this before? Do you feel that this is different or that, you know, we've seen this before? Well, we have seen this before. It, it, it happened when I was in high school and when I was in college, uh, which is the late 60s. Um, and yes, some civil rights um, stuff had been passed. Uh, I think what happened in those days is that um, the people walking point who were nonviolent, um, you know, starting with the freedom riders and the and and sit in people in the early '60s. Um, there's there's just so many times you can sit there peacefully and let somebody beat the shit out of you with a club and spit on you, and either you or the generation right after you or the people who didn't hit the streets when you did. Say, I'm not going to sit there and get hit on the head. So you had ph- phenomenon like the ba- Black Panthers, who basically armed themselves, and then you know were you know the police decided, well, that's a declaration of war. You know we're going to go shoot those people wherever we find them. Um, and the reaction to some of those killings and some of the killings that were of and beatings that were of nonviolent demonstrators. Um, as things did not improve, I mean, people couldn't vote in most of the former, con, you know, Confederate states. Uh, didn't matter who you were, you know, if you were African American, you were not going to allow to, you know, register to vote. It's a uh, violation of federal law, and it and it only very much at the last minute in the mid '60s started being attempted to be enforced that law, um, you know, by the federal government and people had just had it and, you know, they burned down their, their, you know, shitty underserved neighborhoods. And then later on, you know, uh, the LA riots, um, not the Watts riots, but the later LA riots, um, after the Rodney King beating, yeah, that was not that different than this. Um, and that time people said, well, let's not just burn down our own neighborhood. Let's go burn down some other neighborhoods um, of the people we think are, you know, messing our lights up, not giving us a shot, um, you know, treating our neighborhood like it's a third world country that they've invaded. And so that that stuff hasn't been solved. <laughs> you know, it's. It's with us still. And so, yes, I have seen this before. And that stuff bubbles under the surface for a while. And then, you know, it it, it explodes. Well, I think that's a good segue into your latest novel, Yellow Earth. Maybe for my listeners, you could just give a sort of brief rundown of what Yellow Earth is about if they haven't had a chance to read it or they haven't heard about it yet. Yeah, the uh, Yellow Earth, you know, in a condensed version, follows the 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 boom and bust in the shale oil fields of the Bakken, which is uh, an awful lot of it is in North Dakota, some of it's up in Canada, some of it spills into some of the other states. But um, shale oil is is basically something that you don't get without fracking, and fracking is uh more expensive and more involved in, in more manpower has to go into it than traditional drilling. Um but yeah, and and the environmental impact of it is different in every place that you have because the the strata of the rocks is different. So in Pennsylvania where they had fracking, they had problems because sometimes the communities were places that were crisscrossed underneath the ground with old um, uh, coal shafts. And you, you, you cut down into that with your drills and a lot of those old mines that may not be mapped, you may not know exactly what you're drilling into, or you may, um, they may have been flooded. Um, so it's very hard not to 
get flooding into the water system of the people who live around where you're fracking. And so they had a, a, a lot of pollution of people's drinking water um, in Pennsylvania. In Oklahoma, where they dug into it, um, the, the strata underneath the ground was unstable. And so, you know, and fracking is invasive and you're, 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 you're not dynamiting the strata, but you're forcing water into it until it cracks. And in an unstable strata that can cause a bunch of little earthquakes. And that, that's a problem they had there. Um, in North Dakota, in the Bakken, uh, they really didn't have either of those things. Um, what they do have is this problem of spill and you know, toxic spills, and, and those can be pretty widespread. Um, but also, when, when you frack, you have to put an enormous amount of water down into the ground. You mix it with other things in order to, to, to force the, the rock literally to crack horizontally. Um, and then oil, you know, leaches back along the crack lines that you've made, um, into the shaft and you can pump it out. Um, but as that water gets cycled through the ground, there's a lot of radiation down in the ground. Radon, um, you know, is, is what we mostly know, but then, you know, there's other stuff that comes up. So pretty soon you have irradiated water, um, that, you know, you don't want near you <laughs> and you have to put it somewhere. And so, you know, mostly it goes into injection wells and the jury's still out on those injection wells and, and, and whether they're going to pollute groundwater or, or what's, what's, you know, but, it's still that expense. Um, and so the cleanup expense of fracking, you know, and, and I don't, I don't think there's a moral issue here. Uh, you know, it's, it's not immoral to dr drill for oil. It's not immoral to frack for oil. It's just that it costs a certain amount and that the people who are making the profit um, should be paying for the environmental cost. They shouldn't walk away leaving a mess that they don't clean up. And and one of the things that I get into in in, in Middle Earth is that um, very often the bigger companies they subcontract. It's kind of like you know the CIA you use cutouts so nothing is tr traceable to, to to you. Well, a big company can subcontract, and that company can subcontract to another company. Um, so that the cleanup is not the responsibility anymore of the company that's making the money from the oil that's fracked. Um, and then the company that's supposed to clean up, um, if they don't do their job and they're sued, they may just go out of business. And so that cleanup cost, that cost of the injection wells, the cost of cleaning up the spill, the cost of remediating, you know, whatever damage you've done back to what it was before that goes on the public. And so, you know, so, 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 so the cheap, the ch cheap gas and oil that we got from the, the Bakken fracking, and it really did, you know, it, it basically the bust came because it was so successful and and the cost of of gas at the at the pump went way down um it's not that cheap actually another really interesting aspect of yellow earth beyond the sort of ecological mess uh that occurs you know i think the synopsis says uh, all hell breaks loose one of the mm -hmm. other aspects is the socioeconomic impact of this shell oil boom because you have this small town where, you know, people just come to it after this boom and there's people making a lot of money working for the oil company. But the public servants, uh, the teachers, the police force, their wages haven't really increased uh, while all the prices on everything else are increasing. Yeah, it, it, it is. You know, it, it is like a gold rush. I mean, my, my previous novel, A Moment in the Sun, uh, starts during the Yukon gold rush of 1898, you know, and there, you know, the, the, the difference there was towns didn't exist, you know, and all of a sudden 
one day there were a bunch of tents up and then within a month there was a shanty town up and those were you know wild wide open towns and anybody who had been there before was just kind of swept away by the flood um what happens in a in a town like yellow earth you know uh the the city in in um you know, North Dakota, I based it on, and we had about 15,000 people. And then six months later, at 45,000 people, most of those being youngish men without families there and their camp followers. And that, that impact, it, it, it's just, you know, no matter what you do, it's going to be tough on the people who were there before. And some of them, yes, will make money from, from selling oil leases, a lot of the others won't profit in any way. And then, and as you said, you know, the people like the, the police force doesn't necessarily get more resources. In fact, it gets harder for them to keep deputies because the deputies could make a lot more just working for an oil services company because it's, it's crazy money all of a sudden. Um, and you just, you know, it's hard to resist that. Um, hamburgers cost twice as much coffee costs twice as much, you know, all the prices go up. And if you're, you're just there and you're a teacher or you work at a gas station or something like that, you're probably not, you know, taking advantage of the bonanza. Um, it happened, you know, it happened in, in Wyoming, you know, in the seventies, it, it actually happened, um, in uh, Ketchikan and around Valdez after the Valdez oil spill, but so many people came to Alaska for the cleanup and those little Alaskan communities, you know, those people were making a lot of money and, and hand over fist making money. Um, but there was no infrastructure to, d- to deal with them. Uh, the pipeline in Alaska, you know, something similar happened with that. Um, so it's not a, it's not a phen- phenomenon that that hasn't happened before and won't happen again somewhere. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I, I just I think it's a really interesting social phenomenon to look at um, because very rarely is it a boom that just keeps going. There's usually a pretty rapid bust, you know, either the, the gold or the oil pans out or in this case, you know, the, the shale oil is still there. And and somebody may go da- back and and start drilling again and and you know pumping again, but um, that's not going to happen until the price of of oil goes way way up <laughs> from right now. You know, it's it's so far down now. I mean, it, it, you know, I you have to have some, what what the guys who actually work on the rigs go through. Um, they work their butts off. And yes, they, you know, when in a, in a boom situation, they get paid really, really, really well, but they work their butts off. And right now, most of them are out of work and you have to feel for those guys. You know, um, the, the oil business is not doing real well right now. What's interesting to me about Yellow Earth and uh, a lot of your other work, uh, Matt Wan comes to mind, is that, you know, I, I recently interviewed... Noam Chomsky. And, and Chomsky has a very mm-hmm. analytical style in the way he uh, sort of lays out these social problems and these social issues. But I think the stories that you tell, in a way, they almost can grab people more than that sort of cold, hard analysis, uh, because there's a, a humanity to these characters and we come to relate to them. How did you sort of get into writing these stories with a sort of socially conscious bent? You know, I, I, I've always been interested in um, communities of, of people and that uh, rarely is community without some kind of tension. Uh, I grew up in Schenectady, New York, um, when the General Electric Company was based there. And there was always this tension between the IUE, which was the Electrical Workers Union, and the company. And the company always had this card to play of, well, if you people ask for too much money, we're just going to pull out and go to another place. And uh, this town is going to die. Well, they did ask for a lot of money. But basically what happened is the General Electric, piece by piece, 
pulled out anyway, <laughs> just because it was cheaper to make everything that they made somewhere else. And, you know, some of that may have gone to the South. Most of it went off, off, you know, offshore. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a fraction of what General Electric used to have in Schenectady. And, and, you know, to, to some extent, the city is kind of like a very small version of Detroit. Um, you know, a, a lot of people have left. Uh, when I lived there, there were two high schools. There's one high school now. You know, the population has shrunk. And, you know, it's, it's a struggling town, like a, a lot of Rust Belt towns are. Um, well, that, that's, that has an effect on people. And what's good for one person might be bad for another person. And that may change. And then you throw race into that and, you know, that's different. And you throw education and class into that and, you know, other kinds of changes. Um, you know, if there's a war, um, how does that affect people? And each person comes with their own worldview, you know, and it, so, so there's some of it's just what you were born with, but, but also you've developed a worldview. What if you're a fundamentalist Christian? What if you're, you know, you came, you're a red diaper baby? Uh, you know, what if you come from a long line of cops? Um, you know, my, my, both of my grandfathers were cops and, and, you know, people in that generation in, in my family who hadn't been in the U S for very long, were mostly cops and firemen, you know, and there's a kind of package belief system that, that comes with that. Um, you know, all that stuff is interesting to me. And so seeing politics, you know, played out in the lives of people, um, has always really interested me. And I, I'm just curious. I know uh, you were born in Schenectady, New York, mm -hmm. uh, to, I believe, two parents that were uh, involved in, in teaching, and uh, you were yeah. Irish Catholic. Did, did those two elements have any effect on the work you do now or just how you perceive the world? Uh, yeah, well, my mother was Catholic. My father wasn't, uh, okay. but they, they were both Irish on at least one side. Um, Irish and German, actually, both of them, and some other stuff thrown in there. Um, but uh, certainly growing up Catholic in an interesting way, um, you know, because I, I, I think, you know, growing up Catholic is almost like an ethnicity. Um, you know, whether you, you still practice or not, it's kind of like growing up Jewish. Um, and one of the ways it affected me is that when you go to church on Sunday in the Catholic religion, or at least when I grew up, um, the priest always read a little bit of the story of Jesus, uh, the Gospels, and pretty much on the same date, <laughs> every year they read the same one. So after three or four years, once you're you're, you know, conscious and able to remember stuff. You realize I've heard that story before. And so before um, I knew what a simile or a metaphor was, uh, um, you know, I, I, I kind of knew what those were, you know. Uh, and, you know, so the story of the, the loaves and the fish or, you know, Christ, you know, um, you know, healing a leper or whatever. So it is in the kingdom of, of heaven as it is on earth. You you had th this kind of literary kind of education um, uh, and, and about stories, and that stories meant something. Um, you know, Jesus told stories to to illustrate his gospel. Um, so yeah, there. You know, I'm sure that is some of the you know, the background for the, at least the storytelling that I know, you know, and, and, you know, then you get into the Old Testament and, you know, most, mostly I, Old Testament stuff I learned from Charlton Heston movies, um, you know, at least the, the Hollywood version. Now, it's interesting to me, I, I've heard other interviews where you've sort of alluded to the fact that uh, when you went to 
uh, Williams College. Uh, you went for a BA in psychology. Uh, you really weren't mm-hmm. getting into filmmaking or uh, th- not necessarily thinking about becoming a writer. Uh, or even I've even heard you say that you, you didn't really uh, take that many history classes. So it's interesting to me. How did you get involved in writing about uh, historical non or historical fiction and uh, films with a sort of socially conscious bent? I, I think it was the stories. You know, the stories led me in. Um, so I got on the the trail of. Miquelon, for instance, um, from hitching across West Virginia and Kentucky a couple times during a really, you know, kind of confrontational period in the the United Mine Workers. And a couple guys who picked me up talked about, you know, we're going to have another Miquelon massacre uh, if this contention doesn't stop. And and then starting to read about the area and reading about the Hatfields and McCoys and of the little bit that was written at that time about the Maywan massacre and saying, God, this is a better story than the ones I've seen in movies. <laughs> you know, um, I remember reading, uh, I think for a class, maybe not even for a class, just cause I was interested cause it was a, a very hot book at the time, uh, bury my heart at wounded knee. And, um, Every chapter, I could say, oh, I've seen that movie. You know, Charles Bronson played the India in, in that one, or Jeff Chandler, or, you know, Burt Lancaster. It was never an Indian guy, of course, playing the India. But, you know, and, and you know what? This actual history is a much better story than the movie that I saw. And And I think that kind of got me interested in, okay, You know, um, there must be some really good stories there if you dig into the history a little bit. And so certainly a a, a book where, like, um, A Moment in the Sun, where I must have read a hundred books or parts of a hundred books to do the research for that, or Yellow Earth, probably 40, you know, some of them technical books about oil drilling and fracking and you know, others, um, you know, a lot of contemporary stuff because, you know, it, it wasn't something that happened a century ago. It's, it was something that happened, a, you know, a, a couple of years ago. Um, I, I find a lot of inspiration um, for storytelling in the facts and in digging for the facts and in, in saying, well, wait a minute, is this really what happened or is this an urban legend or is this in the case of a lot of stuff that I, I I found for a moment in the sun, a lot of it was bad reportage. It was people making up stuff about the Philippine American War, who had never been to the Philippines, who were just you know hearing some stuff from it and writing for the Hearst newspapers what they thought their the guy who owned the paper wanted the American people to to believe. Um, and that tells you something too when you when you find that kind of history. Um, I, I I worked on um, the uh, the most recent version of the Alamo um, when Ron Howard was going to direct it, and um, it was fascinating to dig into that history. And the main thing I came away from that, you know, that that separated it from in my head from the John Wayne version is that if you really dig into it, the freedom that the Texans were fighting for, were fighting against Mexican, Mexico for, was the freedom to own slaves. That was probably the most important thing on the table, which was that the Mexicans had outlawed chattel slavery. And unlike your cousin over in Louisiana, if you had a, a big spread of land in the Texas colony, which was part of Mexico, it was illegal for you to own slaves and you couldn't get rich. I, I myself went to film school, so I, I had an experience uh, of going to film school, whereas uh, filmmakers like yourself or maybe Michael Moore uh, didn't mm-hmm. necessarily go to film school. But in a, in a way, I think that gives 
you and Michael Moore and others a leg up because while people like me are in film school, uh, you were experiencing the world and maybe that gives you a different insight into people and how to tell stories about people. Yeah, you know, I I don't think film school is bad. Um, the pe- I know a lot of people who have really benefited from it. Um, I think often, the, the you know, there's a certain amount of technical knowledge you can get in film school that you can get elsewhere. You know, it, it, there's there's so much available now online, in books, whatever that wasn't available when I was starting out. <clears throat> but the people I know who really have benefited from film school have benefited because they kind of come out with a posse of people they want to work with. And that often, you know, becomes the core of a bunch of people who, who make a couple movies and then, you know, they may not stay together forever, but, but it's a lot of nice support and, and fellowship when you're starting out. Um, I could have used about a week of film school, you know, just technical stuff. Um, and, you know, and, you know, I kind of learned that by trial and error once I started making movies, but it would have been nice to have known it before. But I do think that you can't just go to film school. Um, I, I think it's good to have a job, you know, that's not about film. I think this is true for actors too. You know, there, there are a lot of actors who start acting, you know, they get in, you know, kid movies and, and, you know, whether they're a Disney kid or, or they just lucky and they start getting some work when they're 13 years old. And by the time they're 30, they've done nothing but be in movies. And you learn a little bit while you're in movies. You know, and, and, you know, some of them are very good actors, but I think they'd be better actors um, if they'd been out in the world. I, I, I think of these guys like Jimmy Stewart or Robert Mitchum or whatever, who, you know, they went to World War II. And they came back very changed and their acting deepened in many cases. Uh, Robert Mitchum was a guy who, you know, he'd been on chain gangs and he'd hopped freights and he'd had shit jobs. And, you know, there was a a life there before he even got into a movie. Um, And I, you know, I think there, there, there was a, an inner resource that those guys had um, that people who, just have been actors their whole lives don't really have. And I think that's true for, for filmmakers too. I think, you know, there's, there's stuff you're not going to learn um, making movies, you know, that, that, that having another life helps you have a perspective on, but I don't think film school is necessarily bad. I, I only think film school is bad is if you come out of it with a huge debt, you know, huge student debt. And, um, you know, I always just say, you know, for how, for that much money, you could have made a feature. And, and just to clarify, I wasn't trying to say that, uh, film school is bad. I, I guess uh-huh. though, it's, I, I know that, uh, I was reading some of your, uh, biographical facts about yourself. And I know you, you worked at different uh, blue collar jobs, for instance. And yeah. I would think that would give you an insight into uh, people that, you know, maybe some kid that goes to film school that is from, you know, a, a very upper middle class or upper class family, maybe they don't experience that. And so they don't have an insight into that sort of realm of society because we're so stratified and I think that does give you a, a leg up in ways in telling stories about all kinds of different people because you're dealing with people from all different walks of life and I, I find that fascinating yeah I, I, I you know for instance um, there's a couple lawyers who are pretty good writers and they you know they, they, they now don't practice law anymore but their years as a lawyer have made them much better writers about crime and law and stuff like that you know, you take a guy um, like, you know, Joseph Lombaugh, um, you know, who was a cop and, you know, he wrote really good cop stuff. And and certainly his time on the force, you know, influenced that. Um, there's a novel I, uh, novelist I really like named Kent Anderson, who's, who's you know, he's written three three novels and, and, you know, his main character is a guy who was a special forces guy. Well, he was a special forces guy in Vietnam that really has influenced his writing. And, and he's just a good writer, you know, just sentence by sentence, but also he has this experience to draw on. 
So, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's certainly useful to have gone around. You know, it doesn't mean that that you have to, but it certainly helps. You know, sw- switching gears just a, a little bit, I, I wanted to mention that I'm probably one of the fans of your work that didn't originally come at your work uh, from movies like Passion Fish or, or Lone Star or Matwan. Uh, as a young teenager, like many young teenagers, I was into these pulpy genre movies. I had a video store mm-hmm. devoted to them. And uh, I know they're not your passion projects, but I loved these movies that would come out back in the 70s and 80s from people like yourself, Joe Dante, Paul Bartel, uh, these movies like The Howling, Piranha, and Alligator. And I know, like I said, they may not be passion projects. They were done by commission. But what I liked about them is that, you know, despite having, you know, aspects of like the typical commercial need for machismo and hot girls and monsters, they often had a very subversive edge. And I was wondering if you could comment on that sort of period within uh, exploitation or, you know, pulp mm-hmm. cinema. Well, I, I you know, some, some, a lot of it goes back to Roger Corman and, uh, you know, Roger was very smart about his audience. Um, he felt like he was mostly, you know, um, making movies for a very young audience. Um, you know, some of them too young to drive. So, they were going to hard top theaters and, you know, some of them were driving, you know, habitues. Um, and that one of the things that young people liked the most, most was a sense of rebellion in the movies themselves. And so, um, a lot of Rogers movies, you know, when he was directing and producing, you know, kept that sense of rebellion. Um, you know, and it, and it could just be, you know, uh, uh, you know, drag car racers in the streets or, you know, uh, good old boys who running away from the local cops or whatever could be bank robbers. Um, but that sense of, you know, let's challenge the official story. Um, and then I think a lot of the filmmakers who worked for him felt like, okay, <laughs> let's make this genre thing a little more interesting, you know, let, let's, let's have it happen some, in some way related to the real world. Um, you know, maybe there's an allegory here, you know, maybe there's, um, a character who, you know, is right out of the headlines here. And so, you know, one of the, one of the ways that you make, make yourself feel like, well, I'm not just doing, uh, a retread of a genre movie is well. How, how do we make this current? How do we make this more interesting? You know, how do we add a little something to this so it's a little bit surprising or it makes you think a little bit. Um, at the same time, that it's got to be fun and it's got to deliver on the pounces or what you know, whatever the, the genre part of it is. Um, Kurt Vonnegut always said science fiction was the most philosophical genre. Because science fiction, you know, um, an awful lot of what science fiction does say, well, what if, you know, what, what, what if there were too many people and we had to get rid of half of them, you know, uh, what if there were beings smarter than us who came down and, you know, they could solve all our problems, but would would that them or would we resist them? You know, what if there were three sexes instead of two? And, and, you know, I think, you know, some people, you know, some of the, the genre stuff that I see today, you know, they, they keep going, you know, there's, there are just kind of simple splattery vampire and zombie movies. And then there's some ones that are a little more interesting. Um, and the same thing with the superhero movies, you know, I, you know, I, I, I really liked, um, you know, uh, some of the Iron Man movies and, um, you know, uh, Black Panther and stuff like that. You know, Thor has had some good episodes of that. You know, one of the problems is, though, of course, is almost every one of them, they're fighting some 
bad guy who wants to destroy the world and you end up with this fight at the end. <laughs> and it's hard to top yourself. It's hard not to come up with something that's done before. And so you have to just do it bigger and louder. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I think of uh, Rod, Rod Serling a lot uh, in the Twilight Zone. I mean, he sort of wanted to do more social commentary type dramas and you know, that was deemed too hot for TV. So he's like, hmm, what can I do? I'll do mm-hmm. these these sci-fi uh, stories, but they'll have a, a social commentary in them. And that's sort of what I like about all those uh, Corman movies. I mean, Alligator in particular, when I, when I saw that as uh, a little kid, I will always remember that scene where... Robert Forrester as the cop is is walking around and there's all these people trying to exploit the misery of, you know, this alligator going around killing people. And I, I know that's a ridiculous plot, but mm-hmm. uh, it was so interesting to me because the one character is like selling alligators and, and little plushy alligator toys. And mm-hmm. Robert Forrester just says, ah, oh, book them. And I, I'm thinking to myself... Yeah. That that character who was selling this stuff was yelling, oh, you're a communist, you're a communist. And I was thinking to myself, mm-hmm. no, that guy's a, a jerk. He shouldn't be doing that. He's exploiting other people's misery. And I, I thought that as a little kid when I saw that movie, and it sort of left a, an odd impression on me. I know it's not the same as, mm-hmm. as Matt Wan, but it's sort of – those movies can leave an odd impression uh, with regards yeah. to some social messaging. Have you ever seen um, Billy Wilder's uh, The Big Carnival? No, I haven't actually. Uh, um, it has another name, um, uh, Ace in the Hole, um, and it's a wonderful movie. But it, it was too cynical for its time, too too realistic. I don't think it's cynical at all, actually. And it's uh, Kirk Douglas plays a a big city reporter who's gotten fired for being kind of an asshole, and he's been sent to some little you know, town in New Mexico, and he stumbles on this big story that could be a national story and get him out of there of a guy trapped in a, in a, you know, a mine shaft. And early on, he discovers there's an easy way to get him out, but it's such a big story. And there's this carnival atmosphere of all these reporters and people selling souvenirs and stuff that builds around this guy trapped in the mine shaft that he he and the the local sheriff conspire not to tell anybody that there's an easier way to get the guy out. And unfortunately, that easier way collapses. <laughs> you know? And, you know, so it, 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 it's not, it, it, you're not pushing it very far with a genre. You have to fear any, any strange phenomenon like that. The media is going to make a big deal out of it. Um, and somebody's going to try to cash in on it whatever it is. Um, so it's just kind of, if you think though, yeah, the, the other thing that I liked about alligator is that cause I was working for Roger Corman, there were things I could do that I probably wouldn't have gotten away if I was working with a studio, which is in, in all those monster movies, alligator is the first one where anybody stumbles upon monster shit. You know, there's like a big alligator poop in the movie. And, you know, Godzilla, what what are these things they they don't excrete? You know, come on. That would be a phenomenon that you'd have to deal with. You know, and and none of, I haven't seen any dinosaur poop in any of those uh, of Spielberg's movies. Um, But it's, you know, it's it's just, you got to think these things through. With with regards to uh, Yellow Earth, and, and this also ties into what you said about sort of what's going on beneath the surface with history. One of the characters that really uh, sort of, I, I was yelling when I was reading the book, was the the character of uh, Brent, who loves quoting Ayn Rand. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember mm-hmm. as a teenager, I, I went through that phase of, you know, the, the libertarian teenager. You know, it's sort of a rite mm-hmm. of passage, I think, for a lot of boys. And mm-hmm. I, I got so mad because I'm thinking to myself, why does everyone always fall into this Ayn Rand trap? I, I think of the the book Anthem, where no one can say the word mm-hmm. I, but now I feel like we live in a society where we can't say the word we anymore. Uh, it, it seems like we live mm-hmm. in a society that is so individualistic that it's become almost dystopian. Well, I think it's it's, it's very attractive, and and 
it is something to be outgrown, definitely. But it's very attractive. Um, it's uh, it's very macho. I mean, despite being a woman, she 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 really admired these really macho, you know, kind of guys. And um, it's very uh, simplistic. It's uh, it 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 pretends that complexity is just obfuscation and not really complexity. Um, and so if you just, if you just follow this, everything will be taken care of and anybody who doesn't is just a loser. And it's very attractive at a certain you know point in your life. Or if, if you're somebody who really just wants to succeed and now with everybody else, it's a great philosophy to have. Um, and you know, Brent's like, he's a user, you know, and he, he discovered it in prison and it just it said, hey, I was right all along. I'm not a bad guy. It's just that society is weighted against us winners. And and I'll know how to play it when I get out, but I'm going to be a winner again. And it's just, you know, I'm going to, you know, find a way to beat the losers and the people who try to keep you down. Um, you know, and, and a lot of cons get into that, you know, and it, and it may be, you know, it may be the um, Aryan Brotherhood, you know, it may be Ayn Rand, it may be something else, but a lot of people, you know, come out of a situation like that saying, okay, I've got the answer now. And it's a simple answer. Um, it might be Jesus, you know. Um, and then, I, you know, you know, his character is based on an actual guy in an actual case where there, you know, there was... Um, uh, uh, a head of a, a tribal council who got into this idea that uh, of sovereignty by the veil and um, led the, the tribes that he, he was, you know, um, pretty much the head man of um, into just kind of opening their arms to the oil business, no, no holds barred. And unfortunately had this con man of a partner, uh, a white guy, uh, who ended up in jail, who actually did have a couple people killed. And so it, it was just such a good news story that you know, I felt like, well, I'm going to change the character somewhat, but um, there they are up in the Bakken. You know, I got to use them somewhere. Do you, do you think something is awakening maybe in younger people uh, that are rediscovering your work? I know a lot of people my age, uh, you know, around their you know, late twenties really have discovered Matt Wan and really love it. And mm -hmm. growing up, a lot of us were taught, ah, the unions, uh, you know, they were all run by the mob and whatnot. And now mm -hmm. seeing what the world is like where unions have barely any power in, in America, mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are, are rediscovering the idea of unions and looking at works like Matt Wan and saying, you know, maybe what we were fed was a false bill of goods growing up. Well, the, you know, the, Certainly, you know, if you saw um, uh, either of the movies about Hoffa, either the Jack Nicholson Hoffa or the Irishman, you know that unions can be corrupted. Um, you know, it's it's not easy to run a democracy, and it's even harder to run a democracy if the the state, you know, local and federal government treat you like a criminal for <laughs> for trying to have a union. Um, you know, and, and, and so a lot of unions got mobbed up at their inception just because they needed sluggers to fight against the people who the owners of the factories hired to beat the hell out of them. Um, and, and, you know, they never really have recovered from that. Um, so one of the things that I'm dealing with in Matewan is not just syndicalism, is not just trade unionism, is union maybe with a with a capital u um which is when when we say us who do we include um and that any any union of any sort whether it's a trade union or just people cooperating with each other there's this complex thing which is you have to actually give up a certain amount of your individuality to join that union and be effective. Sometimes you have to do something that's not immediately good for you and your family 
for the larger good. And that's a really tough thing to ask people to do. And generally, they only do it well when there's a huge threat. So in the case of Mate One, the company was so bad that these, you know, hill, hill country miners and these black people from Alabama and these immigrants not, not only got together, they actually snuck around guards whose job was to keep them from getting together and formed a union. Um, but the treatment had to be so bad, the crisis had to be so bad that that's what kept them together. Uh, in World War II, the country kind of pulled together. Um, not totally, but it kind of pulled together. People were able to put up with, okay, we're not going to have certain things. You know, there's going to be shortages of certain things because the war effort needs it. There's some sacrificing that we're going to do because the war effort needs it. Um, and, and, you know, they did that even more in Britain where they were literally under attack. We didn't get bombed a whole lot compared to, you know, people in Europe. But, you know, this was a very, very polarized country before World War II. It got less polarized during World War II. Um, and then we've drifted back into this extreme polarization again. But, um, you know, trade unions aren't necessarily a bad thing. And if they weren't there, uh, you're working for Walmart. You're, you know, you're working for a company that pays you pretty much minimum wage and then may have a seminar on how to get unemployment benefits because they're not going to hire you for a 40 hour week so they can call you a temporary employee. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, some of why I made May one was it was at a time, um, when unions were being hunted down and killed left and right. The Reagan years. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious with regards to mate one, and then, uh, we'll start, uh, closing out. I just had two questions with regards to it. Did, did you deal with any, uh, members of the IWW, the Wobblies, uh, when researching that uh, film, and also uh, any good experiences you had with uh, the great cinematographer Haskell Wexler. I love his movie Medium Cool from 1969. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there there still is, I think, on paper in IWW. It, it's not a very powerful organization. Uh, we could use something like it again. I think maybe the... the, the um, I think it's that called the SEIU is the thing that comes closest to it, which organizes people like people who work in groceries and, and nurses and, you know, um, uh, you know, it's not just a one industry kind of thing, but people were often getting paid very close to minimum wage, if not minimum wage. Um, but certainly the, you know, the character of, Joe Canahan that Chris Cooper plays is a guy who was in the IWW. Um, they basically were jailed during World War, World War One because um, they advocated um, resistance to the draft for World War One, and most of their leaders were jailed, and uh, a lot of their members were beaten. Some were hung. Some were shot. Um, and so it was, it, it, it lost its power in the thirties, um, with Haskell, you know, that make ones with the first time I worked with Haskell. Um, it was nice to work with a, a cinematographer who actually understood and was really interested in the politics of the movie and, and knew some of that history. Um, uh, at one point in the movie, when uh, the black and Italian miners decide to go on strike, the Italians march off singing Avanti Popolo, which is a you know, left-wing Italian work song. And uh, Haskell said, I think I'm the only cinematographer in Hollywood who knows the lyrics to that song. Um, so it was really fun to get to work, you know, besides his skill and what he brought to, to the filmmaking, it was fun to get to work with Haskell. Um, there's a, a, a famous... Um, early kind of strike film um, called Salt of the Earth, 
um, that was uh, independently made. A bunch of the people involved with it, both actors and people behind the camera, had been blacklisted, uh, uh, made down in, in um, New Mexico. And the FBI and their State Department were so on the case in that McCarthy era um, that they couldn't find a laboratory that was willing to, um, you know, develop and print the film. And Haskell was a young man who was already working, uh, making commercials and industrials up in Chicago. And he knew some of the players who made Salt of the Earth. And so he had friends at the lab in Chicago and put a different label on the film cans, pretending that it was an just industrial film and actually got it um, developed and printed for them. So the film actually wouldn't have existed <laughs> to be seen except for Haskell before he even became known as a cinematographer. Wow. Well, I, w- I want to thank you for coming on Parallax Views, John Sills. Uh, in closing, uh-huh. I-, I just have to ask you uh, really briefly here. One of the things that really stands out to me about your work is that you really provide portraits of human beings and their relationships, and you never fall victim to a cynicism about people and social relations. You view uh, your characters as fully human. How do you keep yourself from getting cynical in moments like these where, you know, it feels like uncertain times for many of us? What what sort of keeps your hope uh, alive and well? Well, I think I think the um you know the uh two things keep me up. One is that, that I have a very specific um definition of the difference between pessimism and cynicism. Pessimism is when you think things are likely to go badly. Cynicism is when you hope they go badly because that justifies you acting in a bad manner yourself. Um, and, and I think there's a, there's a big difference between those two. And I may be pessimistic, but I, I, I try not to be cynical. Um, and the other is, you know, there's this famous phrase of, um, you know, that, that there are no final victories. But also, if there are no final de- victories, there are also no final defeats. And, you know, the way that I see history is there, there, there's always the next day story. You know, you you finish up a story a certain way. Well, there's always the next day. We don't know what happens next. And, and you know, and so there's always, you know, there's always that hope that your, your, your characters can turn it around if things, you know, if they're still alive, if they're still breathing. Um, you know, there's, there's hope for redemption. There's hope for a second act. Um, you know, uh, the story isn't over until the fat lady sings, as they used to say. Well, it's just like real life. I mean, I, I may yeah. be a little bit disturbed by, you know, the, the sort of rampant libertarian individualism that a lot of people uh, express at times. But at the same time, there's also a ton of people saying, maybe, maybe we should go in a different direction. And there's always the struggle. And as long as that struggle's still yeah. ongoing, I guess there's still hope. And and if you read history, there was no golden age. <laughs> you know? there's nothing that we've lost that was so wonderful that we can't come up with something. Well, John Sills, I want to thank you again for coming on Parallax Views. If you could uh, let my listeners know how they can get a hold of your new novel, Yellow Earth. Yeah, I'd say the best thing to do if you have a local bookstore that you'd like to um, support that can order books for you, you can you can have them order Yellow Earth um, through Haymarket Press. Um, or else you can just go online to Haymarket Press and order it from them directly. But do support your local bus or if you've got one. Well, thank you again, John Sills, for coming on Parallax Views. Okay, thanks a lot, OG. Well, that does it for this edition of... Parallax Views. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with John Sills. It was truly a pleasure, a dream come true 
to speak to such a highly regarded figure in the world of filmmaking and storytelling, I must say. And I highly recommend checking out John's latest novel, Yellow Earth. You will not be disappointed. John always tells very complex, very human stories that get at the heart of the issues facing our world today and historically. Also, gotta give some kudos to Haymarket Books for publishing Yellow Earth. Great job, guys. Keep it up. Let me know what you thought about this edition of Parallax Views by dropping me a line on Twitter at Views Parallax or by email at ParallaxViewsPod at ProtonMill.com And of course, if you can, please support me on Patreon at Patreon.com slash ParallaxViews You, the Patreon supporters of this program, are the reason that I can continue to record and publish Parallax Views on a full-time basis. So, if you haven't considered supporting Parallax Views before, and you have the financial means to do so, please consider throwing me some spare change. It helps me out a great deal, and the content will keep coming if you can help support me in that manner. Of course, also, if you can't support me on Patreon, there's always the tweets, the shares on Facebook. Just getting the word out there about Parallax Views is what keeps this show alive. So again, like, share, retweet, and if you can, support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. That's patreon.com slash parallaxviews. And with that being said, until next time, you've been listening to Parallax Views with Parallax Views to Parallax Views with Parallax Views. The way out is not simply to say, don't do it, just to prohibit. If nothing else, if we don't do it, others will be doing it like crazy. So, you know, we have to confront the problem. But no, basically, basically, I'm, I know of the great anxiety problems, new forms of control, but it's also new forms of freedom. This is why I always emphasize that uh, uh, internet and all this new digital stuff, it's a very ambiguous phenomenon, but it's the field of struggle. New forms of enslavement, but at the same time, new incredible forms of freedom. We have to accept the fight with no nostalgia for old, allegedly more authentic communities or whatever. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid.